Okay, so let's um, go to the last uh, session and last topic. Um, we will see how to apply stabilized finite element methods of variation of multiscale type to linear waves in mixed form. We will see what that means. So it's a linear problem, but the waves will be written in in mixed form. So there are several things about what what I will say that are general, and others that are our development. So. <coughs> Uh, first, first let, let me uh, explain what is the situation. What type of waves are I'm talking about? I'm talking about hyper classical hyperbolic waves that come from second order differential equations in time and space. So you know that the wave equation is this 1 over c squared d2p dt squared minus Laplace of p equal to s. Okay? This is the classical wave equation, second order wave equation. It models many phenomena, many phenomena, vibrations, acoustics, or whatever. I mean, it's a wave equation. It's hyperbolic, both in the classical sense and the in the geometrical sense. In the classical sense, you mean that you classify that according to the bilinear form associated to the problem. It's uh, non-definite. In the geometrical sense, it is hyperbolic because there are many folds that keep constant in time, that keep undeformed in time. And that's a very interesting equation. However, that equation can be split into two. We could write this equation, well, suppose this is one. We could write this equation as dp dt plus divergence of u equals to f or f1 and the u dt plus gradient of p equal f2. So if you take the divergence, uh, if you take the time derivative of this equation, the second derivative of pressure of P plus the divergence of the first derivative of U, but the first derivative of U is minus gradient of P. So you would get that with a certain with a certain F. Okay? So do you see that this is equivalent to this? Okay, but sometimes this is required. Okay, sometimes this is required. I will not talk about this for the sake of conciseness. So uh, we will talk about linear waves in mixed form. So that's m the mixed form. You see, P is a scalar, U is a vector. So which is, um, and in that case, as in all the cases we have seen, we have a compatibility condition between the velocity and the pressure. Let, let me call it velocity and pressure, just uh, to keep the same notation always. And uh, we have a compatibility condition that is different to what we have seen so far. And we have now a time-dependent problem. So this is useful to explain our variation of multiscale framework. So uh, in general, we have seen in this course that variational multiscale formulations are used to, to introdu are introduced to motivate the stabilized finite element methods. And we have seen of the two types. First, to deal with singular perturbed problems such as convection diffusion with a small diffusion, or reisner mindley plates, or uh, momentum, momentum deflection problems. Anyway, there are many problems of singular perturbation type. And also to avoid the subcondition between the variables in play. For example, we have seen the Stokes problem. We have seen the Darcy problem. We haven't talked about this, which is the imposition of boundary conditions through Lagrange multipliers. But this is also a mixed problem with uh, uh, in subconditions that have to be satisfied. So you need stabilized finite element methods for many reasons. And as we know, the idea is to split the unknown into the finite element solution plus the subscale and to approximate the subscales. Usually, I have mentioned that in transient problems, the subscales are considered stationary. So the time derivative of U prime is usually taken to be zero. In nonlinear problems, its nonlinear effects are neglected. Um, we don't do any of these things. We consider the time derivative of u prime, and we, in nonlinear problems, this problem is linear. We keep the we keep the nonlinear dependency on u prime. We clearly define the space in which it, it belongs. We will see that, and usually the boundary values are, are discarded. We will also discard them. We will also neglect them, but we can take them into account. So our project, our idea is uh, is. Uh, to avoid all these simplifications as much as possible. Not all of those, but all of them. First, as I said, in transient problems, we consider the time derivative of u prime. We consider what we call dynamic subscales. We take into account the nonlinear effect of the subscales. We take them orthogonal to the finite element space. That's what I mentioned uh, yesterday and today's morning. 
and uh, we can compute the boundary from transmission conditions, but I will not talk about that. Okay, and I will not talk about nonlinearity either. Okay, in this particular case, uh, that was a, a, also a talk that I gave, by the way, last September. So this is more recent, recent than than the others. Um, an additional objective of that talk was to explain why the wave equation needs to be stabilized. You know, this is not a, a common a problem as common as the Stokes problem or a problem as common as the as the Darcy problem. Maxwell's problem is not very common either. Okay, so let's see which is the pro the, the, C, the mixed uh, form of the wave equation and why it needs to be stabilized. Hmm? So there are many cases in which the equations that you get are those, not the hyperbolic wave equation, but you in fact get the mixed form of the wave equation. For example, that happens in shallow water flows. Those of you that know. Uh, if if any know, anybody knows about uh, flows of, of shallow waters, those are the so-called Sembenance equations, the linear case of the Sembenance equations, hmm? the linear case of Sembenance. So here you have P is pressure, physically is the pressure, uh, U is the velocity, physically it is the velocity, H is the depth of the computational domain of the, of the uh, water of uh, the, 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 uh, the, the water domain, G is gravity, and those are given body forces. So these equations and in fact the equations you have to solve. But as I said here, as I said here, you take the derivative of this of this first equation in time, so you have the second derivative in time, then you have the divergence of the derivative of u, but the derivative of u is given here. So you get this expression. In the case of, of the Sembenant equation, the equations of, of shallow waters, f is given in terms of f u and f p by this expression, and c, which is the wave speed, is in the case of shallow waters again the square root of gravity times height. Okay, gravity times height. You see, gravity is length over time square. This is length, so this length is square over time square. So this is a velocity. Okay, this is a velocity. Okay, so th those are these are um, this is a, a, a simple motivation of uh, why. Sometimes you get originally the, the the mixed form of the wave equations. We are dealing with this mixed form. So the problem, uh, this is interesting because the problem can be written in this way. I mean, th this is just a way to write the problem: the time derivative of pressure, time derivative of velocity, plus the divergence of the velocity, and here you have the gradient of the pressure equal to the right hand side. And this is a matrix of operators, not a matrix of scalars, but a matrix of operators. So, it turns out that the problem is well posed in H1 for pressures and H dip for velocities. Here we have the divergence of the velocity, the divergence of the velocity, sorry, and here the gradient of the pressure. So, if both are L2, the problem is well posed. Do you see something surprising here to, to, uh, with respect to what we said this morning about Darcy's problem? In Darcy's problem, you know we had either q in h1, but then u velocity in h in l2, or velocity in h dip, but then q in l2. Do you remember this? In the case of of uh, the wave equation, we have we can have it's well posed. I don't say that this, this is the only space. In fact, we will see other choices. In the case of the wave equation, it happens that we can have high regularity for both pressure and velocity. High for both, which is unusual. Hmm? Why is that? Where do you think that the regularity, that uh, let's say, um, that possibility to have regularity comes from? Well, it's not obvious, but it's from the time derivative. Okay. In general, in, in, in equations of first order, not parabolic at all, but the equations of first order, time has always a regularizing effect. And we will see the theorem that guarantees that. OK, I shall forget about units. I shall forget about physical constants. And I'll take g equal 1, h equal 1. OK? So it turns out that if you define the space v as, uh, as uh, vp cross vu, so the uh, space of, of regular solutions of regular solutions and l as l2 times l2 so you test this against uh, 
against functions in L2 and this equation against functions in L2 as well. You can write the problem in this way. You can write the problem as follows. Find a pair U, which U has two components. U is the, is the unknown, this unknown, P uh, both as U. So, that is the unknown U. Okay? All together is, uh, is light U. Light U is the, all the unknown together. So, it has to be continuous in time, continuous in time, oh, I'm very classical here, I'm considering the problem, uh, 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 the, uh, an equation in C0, okay, so I'm very classical. So, um, the function is continuous in time with values in V, in the space of regular solutions, and only, excuse me, C1 in time, so more regular in time, because I want to take the derivative, but then with values in L. So, you see? Where I am looking for a solution of this problem? I am looking for a solution which is continuous in time. Here it's continuous and then C1, but when I take the derivative, it will be continuous. And L2 in a space. L2 in a space because this is L, so that will be L2 in a space. Once I take the derivative, that will be L2. And once I take the function belongs to V in a space, but once I apply the operator A, the operator, this is the operator A which is divergence and gradient, I will get a solution that is only L2. So, that's what, that what, this is an equation that holds uh, in, in, in L, in L in a space and continuous in time. You more or less follow what I have said? So, this is, this is a partial differential equations. I'm not doing numerics here, not, do, not yet. And a little bit, and we need a little bit of function analysis. So this is the unknown, and this is the this is the operator a. A of u is divergence and gradient of pressure. So so far so good. What is the variational form of the problem? We are not using the classical variational form so far. So see what we do is we test the equation against a function in L, and L is essentially L2 for both components. So the space where we have the solution and the space where we take the test function is different. Okay. But it happens that this problem is still well posed. So this is not a not classical variational form in the steady state sense, but the problem is well posed. And that relies on the following conditions. First, you have to show that A is monotone, that in this case means this. So it's not coercive, just monotone. It means that when, when I test it against U itself, it's non negative. You see, this is not coercivity. This is only monotonicity of the operator L. Okay? Yes? Right. Yes. We'll go back to that point. That's a good question. You will see that the space would be H1 for P and only L2 for U. So only L2 for the We will back, go back to that. For, for, for that should not be C2. <laughs> That's, that would be C1, yes, C1. But then it, it would be C1, but then you, you have to understand the equation with less regularity in time. So what I said is that when I write this equation, I understand that this L2 in X and C0 in time. Okay? Here, in the mixed form. In the mixed form. If I want P only in, that, in this case, in this case, if I require, for example, I require a typical thing, which is P, H1 in time, with values in H1 in the space, if I require this, which would be typical, then I, I would understand this equation where uh, H minus 1 in X in space and um, H minus 1 in time. You understand? So everything, everything, so it's up to you, the space where you look for the solution. That's something, the message that I also would like to give. So here, when you take the peak in H1, this holds, this is a, a, an element, an object, in H minus 1. And the same for that term regarding the temporal derivative. But I will understand now the equations in a more classical sense. I said that it would be very classical. So this is an equation that I understand. Continuous in time, I could weaken that. I could weaken that. And L2 in X, because in that case, I can guarantee existence. Here you are getting U by dt plus A. So 
so you are telling that you belong to C1 because you are telling du by dt. Yes. But suppose it will be ds by u by dt as well, then that should be C2. No, if I take, depends. That depends on, uh, again, that depends on where, in which sense do I understand this equation in, in time? In which sense do you want? I mean, if you want, if you want, I can take it in C minus 1, H minus 1, H minus 1, and here only L2 in, no, no, L2 in time, can, yes, for first derivatives I could take it L bound, only L infinity in time. I could take it L infinity in time with values in L, and then all, uh, um, L infinity only in time, with values in L, and then that will be a function that should be understood in, in the space of, in the dual of the bounded variation functions. This is too technical, maybe, but that requires uh, some uh, differentiation uh, theory. But uh, I would, if, if, if I take the function only bounded, or C0 if you want, or uniformly C0, C0 on the closure, which is uh, uniformly continuous, if I take the function only uniformly continuous, then that equation would hold, would hold in a weaker space. And I said, no, no, I'm going to be very classical. I am going to understand this equation in C0. Will it have a solution? I don't know. That depends on whether f is also regular enough. You know, that, that the message is, you can pose the equations wherever you like, as soon as all terms make sense. Of course, <laughs> something that you cannot, uh, let, let, let's say, bargain, is that all terms have to be well defined have to be bounded. But once all terms are bounded, you can pose the equation wherever you wish. Whether you will find the solution or not is up to you. I mean, you have to prove it that you will get a solution. Do you understand the message? OK, so I, I think that this equation in the spaces that I posed, uh, that I posed it, it has a solution because the, those properties hold. Operator A, A is monotone and is maximal. I will not go into details. It happens to be monotone in our case, and it happens to be maximal. When, when we have an operator that have, has these properties, so those are properties of, uh, of functional analysis, it can, there is a theorem that is here in Yosida's theorem that guarantees that there exists a unique solution that is bounded in this way. Okay? Forget about it. That is just a, a, a well poseness for it. Well, maybe it's important to obtain these bounds because it explains why the Golurkin method does not work. How do you get these bounds? So it, that means that the soup in time of the L norm of uh, U is bounded. The soup of the derivative is also bounded because I am assuming that the derivative is continuous, otherwise I would not be able to find it. And the soup in v of, of the v norm, so the, of the continuous norm of u, is bound. How do you get these bounds? So this is stability bounds. You see, the, pro, the, the fact is the following. That to get these bounds, first, uh, you, the, the first one is easy. You take v equal to u, and again, you use the monotonicity. Uh, then you take the, set that, the, the differentiate equation in time, and you get a similar bound. So those are this is it. The message is here. The message is here. How do you get the bound in V? V, remember, V is H1, HD. So the space of derivatives, message, concept. That's the spaces of derivatives. Which of these bounds, which is the most useful one from the numerical point of view? This last one. The last one. Excellent. Why? Because it gives me control of the derivatives. If I don't have the derivatives out of, out of uh, if I don't have the derivatives under control, I can have wild oscillations. Okay, so that's the important bound. How is this bound obtained? This bound is obtained by taking v equals to a of u. Since since a maps v to l, and I have to take v in l, that is possible. That is possible. So I can take the test function equal a u. What does that mean? It means that I take the test function, the first component equal to the gradient of the pressure, and the second component equal to the divergence of the velocity. That's how the second bound is obtained. Okay? This is very important. What happens when you do numerics, when you do finite arguments? The failure of the Galorkin method to approximate the wave equation in mixed form. If you uh, do finite elements in space only, you leave time continuous, you have to find a, a u that is continuous, c1 in time, 
such that uh, 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 with values in VH, now a finite element space. And that's the equation you have using the Golurkin method, just replacing uh, continuous solutions by discrete finite element solutions. The first and second estimates of the continuous problems hold for the discrete one, and the, the proof is the same. So those two estimates, those two, are also true. But what happens with the last one? For the last one, you have to take the test function equal to the unknown. But this is not possible in the finite element case. Why is it not possible? <laughs> In the finite element case, why it is not possible to take the test function equal to a times u? Why? In the finite element of basis function. No, the, the answer is simple. Okay, it's a simple answer. So you take v of a u, a function that belongs to the finite element of space. What will happen with a u? Will it belong to the finite element of space? What is the differentiation? Of course, A involves derivatives. A involves gradients and divergence. Yeah, in the morning, you told that if we have a space, then it will be discontinuous. Exactly. Well, exactly. That's exactly what happens. If you have a function that belongs to the finite element space, velocity and pressure, A of U does not belong to the finite element space. Why? Because you take a derivative and you, uh, you, know, you go outside the finite element. So you cannot take the test function equal to a u. So that estimate does not hold. Then what happens is that the L2 norm of p and u is bounded, the L2 norm of both, okay, for the wave equation, but not the L2 norm of the derivatives. Neither the L2 norm of the gradient of the pressure nor the L2 norm of the divergence of the velocity. Here I have a remark, the equivalent to lax milgram in the steady state case is precisely Julio <coughs> Cedar's theorem. That is a theorem of well posedness of problem in the uh, of time dependent problems. In general the idea when you deal with time dependent problems is that uh, time also always regularizes the solution. Okay, that, this is a general message. So time makes the solution more regular. Well, this is what happens when you solve the problem using the Golurkin method. So this is a, a stupid problem, you know. The propagation of a wave, in that case, from the from the right to the left. So the contrary to what is usual, a solitary wave that moves from the from the left to the right. If you apply the Golurkin method, you obtain something funny at the outlet, you know, at the at the exit, you know, so something very strange. It looks like uh, oscillating widely, oscillating widely then it gets uh, constant and you have the good profile. So this is just a wave propagation from the left to the right. Of course, if you use the stabilized finite element method that uh, I will describe, you get the perfect solution. Okay, you get a wave that moves from the right to the left uh, smoothly. So the solution of this problem is just a propagating wave, a solitary wave. Okay. So this is a simple problem that will allow, uh, allow me to explain, to summarize our variational multiscale method. And it's very nice. So this is, you, I mean, this is for the uh, wave equation, but that could be done in general, okay, in, for all the equations. So which, our, which is our, met, uh, our method? I, I, I have repeated that several times already. We split the space into the finite element component plus the rest. We split uh, accordingly the, the unknown and the test function. And then the original problem is exactly, exactly equivalent to this, exactly. So first I speed u into uh plus u prime, u uh plus u prime, uh plus u prime, uh plus u prime everywhere. And first we test with pH and then we test with u prime. In this case I say exactly, and this is the adjoint operator of L. Why do I say exactly? Because this is a first order operator. First order. It's not like the convection diffusion or stocks that was second order. In the case of a first order operator, we don't have boundary terms. Okay? We don't have boundary terms. So there is no, and there is not, no, and there is not this problem about, there is not the problem about the definition of the second derivatives. You remember that we said the Laplacian is not defined globally because if we have a continuous function, the first derivative is discontinuous and the second derivative is a delta function. In that case, we only have first derivatives. Okay, so it's very, that's very nice. So it just, you see, if you move here the, uh, the, uh, the adjoint and instead of the adjoint you use A, that is, it is obvious, but the, uh, the adjoint. Which, which is the objective? The objective is to approximate u prime because this is a difficult equation. We, we want to approximate u prime and insert the expression for u prime 
in the first equation leading to a modified Golurkin product. I have explained this idea several times. This is the idea of the variational multiscale method. So what do we do? First point, we consider the space of subscales. Well, we use subscales that are dynamic and orthogonal to the finite time space. This is our uh, proposal. So we take the space of subscales as orthogonal to the finite element space. That, that allows us to simplify the problem because that equation for the subscales, which is this one, I have copied this equation, can be simplified. How? First, this by this is zero because B prime is orthogonal to UH and of course also to the derivative of UH. So this by this is zero. And this is the projection, the L2 projection onto the space of subscales, which, which now is orthogonal to the final common space, of this operator. And this is exact, you see, by the way, the, the projection of the derivative is the derivative itself because this element already belongs to the final common space. So that's exact. No approximation so far. Okay, contrary to second order problems, here there is no approximation. This is the projection onto the space of subscales of the finite element residual. This, again, is exact. So, and then uh, once we have, once we solve this equation, let's see how, let's see how approximately we insert u prime here in the first equation and we are done. So this is exactly the problem, exactly. No approximation so far. Only, of course, this is no approximation, but this is as difficult as the original problem, of course. Good. So how do we approximate that problem? So this, here is a simple description of uh, the Fourier analysis that I have mentioned several times. But for second order problems is a little more involved. For first order problems is simpler to explain. So what is the idea? The idea is that we will Fourier transform this term. We will Fourier transform this term. And that will lead us to a matrix multiplying the Fourier transform of uh, u prime, the Fourier transform of u prime. That will lead to a matrix with the Fourier transform of u prime. This is a vector. And a very important thing is that we have to scale the equations in order to have uh, uh, the product f, f is the right hand side, multiplied by f well defined. What do I mean by that? This is something very important when you deal with uh, systems of equations. Very important. So, for example, in the Stokes case, let's consider the Stokes case that we have seen several times. In this way of writing the equations, in this way of writing the equations, we know that if we test this against a function v and we test this against a function q, we can add up the two, the two equations. So in a sense, if this is the right hand side, let me call it f1 and f2. I know that f2 is 0, but just to talk about units. If, if we call it f1 and f2, I know that b times f1 has the same units, that the square bracket means to it, as q times f2. How do I know that? Well, very easily. Look, for example, at this term, v gradient of p has the same units as Q divergence of U. So units of velocity, units of pressure divided by length. Units of pressure, units of velocity divided by length. That's why we can add up the two equations. Okay? So the units of F multiplied by the units of velocity are equal to the units of F multiplied by, multiplied by units of pressure. However, we cannot take the norm of F1, F2. The norm of, of that vector, squared if you want, or, or the Euclidean norm of that vector would be f1 squared plus f2 squared. And these two vectors have completely heterogeneous units. That which are the units, for example, of f1 squared? You can see that here. The units of f1 squared are units of this viscosity squared divided by length squared. Viscosity squared divided by length to the power of 4, by the way. 4, because it's, uh, the, the derivative is 1 over length squared, times u squared. And which are the units of f1 squared? Just 1 over length squared, velocity squared. And these units don't match. Understand? That is general general. So even if you, in, a, in an abstract problem, L u equals f, 
and you vector prove it, vector prove it, okay, vector prove it. Even if this is well defined, uh, sorry, even if, if this the, uh, v, trans, v transpose f well defined, well defined component wise, so that means v1 f1 plus v2 f2 plus whatever, vn fn, all the units are well defined, that does not mean that f times f is well defined. From the well defined from the unit point of view. Okay? Do, do you understand the idea? This is very important. And now we are going to take the norm of the residual, the norm of f. So the message is that not, that norm has to be properly scaled. So we have to introduce a matrix M. We have to introduce a matrix M such that this product is well defined from the unit point of view. Okay? That's it. The rest is easy. Because now we can define the associated norm weighted by the scaling. This is a scaling norm. And then we can compute the norm of, uh, of this term. Let's compute the norm of this term. The norm of this term, because of Plancherel's formula, is going to be equal to the norm of the transform derivative. This is the first uh, result that I, that I use. So the norm of this term is going to be the norm of the, of, uh, of, of the tra Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform, the norm of the Fourier transform, the L2 norm of the Fourier transform is defined here. Is defined here. Now I use just the Schwarz inequality, and this smaller equal the norm of S times the norm of U prime. Okay, norm of matrix S. And this is going to be a matrix now. This is an, a differential operator, but this is a matrix, and this is the norm of U prime. And now I'm, I'm going to use the mean value theorem. I know if this is positive and this is positive that there exists a value k zero, a wave number. There exists a certain wave number for which this will be equal to this. So there exists a wave number that, that allows me to take out this value evaluated at k0. And now I go back and I use uh, Planchel's formula again, and I know that the L2 norm of the Fourier transform of u is equal to the L2 norm of u without the Fourier transform. OK? So what is the approximation that we use? The approximation that we use is we approximate that operator, that differential operator, project it if you want by a matrix, a matrix tau minus one, with the design condition, with the design condition that the norm of that operator is equal to the norm of the Fourier transform at a certain wave number, which we don't know. That's why we have algorithmic constants. The constants we don't know. Why? Because in fact, we don't know which is the wave number for which the mean value theorem holds. Okay, you can identify the algorithmic constants with the mean wave number for which the mean value theorem holds. Okay, that's what we do. And that is what I said uh, yesterday that has been useful in, for us for many problems for uh, Navier-Stokes, for uh, convection diffusion, for Maxwell, for RC, for waves, for many other problems, okay? And now we are done. Now, now, now we have finished because you see, I, I, I have written here, I have written here exactly the same equations as here, but replacing this, this differential operator, replacing this differential operator by an algebraic operator tau minus one, a matrix. Mm -hmm. And that is it. So not wh what does it mean? It means that we have to integrate the equation for the subscales in time, and at each, gauss, an, an each time step, we are, will be able to express the subscales in terms of the finite element residual, put it here, and have a problem for the subscales alone. Okay, functional setting and tau design. Which is the functional setting? We have seen variation, what we will call here variational problem one, which is this one, H1, HD. This is not possible for the Rc's problem, but is possible for the wave equation. That's it, okay? So divergence in L, uh, divergence in, uh, excuse me, velocities in H dip, pressures in H1, okay? That wouldn't be a well-posed problem for the steady state case. So if we don't have the time derivative, that wouldn't be well-posed. But the problem is well posed because of Hildiocida's theorem. However, there is the possibility to, to write variational uh, problems. There is this possibility similar to what we did for Stokes. So, uh, excuse me, for Darcy. So we can have pressures in L2 and velocities in H dip by integrating by part the pressure gradient or pressures in H1 and velocities in L2 by integrating by parts the divergence of the velocity. Exactly the same as for Darcy. So, in fact, 
for the sea we had two options, which was regular velocities, not regular pressures, or not regular velocities and regular pressures. Here we have another possibility, and is that both are regular. Okay? I will not insist in that because those are technical details. Okay, so uh, in our case, um, in our variation of multi-scale approach that has been defined before, we have to define the scaling matrix. Uh, I haven't. I have talked about that in the case of uh, in the case of the Darcy problem, but that scaling matri matrix can be shown to be this. Can be shown to be physical coefficient multiplied by a length scale that has to be determined. That has to be determined, and that length scale is what will allow us that length scale, which is free, which is free is what will allow us to switch from variational form 3 to variational form 2 and to variational form 1. So playing with the length scale will allow us to change the functional setting. So I will not insist on that because I think we would like to have some time for the questions. So that is the final method, the stabilized finite element method that we obtain. So again, it's always the same. In, in our case, we have the orthogonal projection of the residual for the, the method that we proposed. And we have proved uh, stability and convergence, so this is stability and convergence, uh, in that norm, which is optimal. So we have everything that we wish, OK? So the message is, of course, th these are all technical de uh, details. The message is that uh, we have been able to prove stability and convergence in, in that norm, which happens to be optimal. I will not go to the details. I will not talk about the time discretization because, of course, once you have the problem, uh, what I have been talking about is about the problem discretized in space and still continues in time. Once you have that problem, you have to discretize in time as well. For the time discretization, we get something very similar. A lot of cases, because we have analyzed two methods, you see. In our paper, in the paper, we have about that. We have two stabilized methods. Three variational forms, variational form 1, variational form 2, and variational form 3, and three time integrations. So first order, sec backward Euler, uh, Krang we have backward Euler, Krang, Krang Nicholson, backward Euler, Krang Nicholson, and BDF2. So we analyze two, two methods for th uh, three time integrations for three variational forms, variational form 1, 2, and 3. So it means that 3 times 3 times 2. So we had to analyze uh, 18 cases. And the results were op all optimal and are shown here. Okay, But I will not talk about it. We have tested that and everything works. But um, I will not explain about it. So which is the message? The message is that this is a third problem. I, I thought I would uh, give some more time to that, but uh, that's enough. Uh, do we have a third problem, which is slightly different to the others, that requires, um, that requires stabilization? Why? Because uh, even though it's transient, even though it's transient, the estimates that uh, Heliosidus theorem allows us to, uh, to guarantee the smoothness of the solution do not apply in the discrete case. Okay? Do not apply in the discrete case, and therefore we have to stabilize. How do we stabilize? Using also the variational multi-scale uh, approach that, uh, that I have been explaining. Okay? So I will conclude here. We have only 15 minutes, but I, I can take longer if you wish. Uh, so it's uh, up to you. And um, maybe now I can answer the questions that uh, you have posed. Can I move that up? So I don't have the list of questions with me. But uh, maybe you have it. And I know that uh, they are, uh, as, uh, some of them are related to the comparison between um, VMS, let's say variational multiscale, SUPG, uh, PSPG, SUPG, that you, I haven't mentioned, but you, have, you know, um, Taylor Galerkin, and what else? If you have the list. Uh, Pardon me? Oh, GLS, yeah, okay. So in you one, I will consider the, um, the Stokes problem with convection, which is a, a linearized form. This is a linearized form of the Navier-Stokes equation, the station. So time, 
let's forget time to explain what I want. So this is the Stokes problem with convection. If A, the, the attraction velocity is equal to U, that will be Navier Stokes. Okay? This problem is called Ossian's problem. It's a Stokes problem with convection. So they ask you five questions, five of them are here. Okay. Yes, I know, I remember three of them. Let's, well, let's, let's list that. Mm -hmm. Hey, SUPG, PSPG for Navier Stokes equations. SUPG, PSPG. For Navier Stokes. For Navier Stokes. Which one? GLS for Navier Stokes. SUPG for Navier Stokes in decoupled framework. You mean fractional steps? Yes. So, Ampire is now via VMS for Navier Stokes with SUPG, PSPG, GLS, and bubble. What? What? Sorry again? Ampire is now of VMS for Navier Stokes with SUPG, PSPG, GLS, and also comparison with bubbles, bubbles, case with bubbles. Last question is uh, comments on clear and then for the distance. Which one? Yeah. The last comment is? Uh, comments on clear and then method for the distance. And then we can add. These are something which they asked to me, I think. Well, um, I mean, I could talk about each uh, for a while, but. Uh, the, the, the answer, I mean, I will answer those three at the same time, of course. Uh, those can be answered at the same time, okay? And that, that it, for this, it suffices to consider the linear, this linearized problem, or since problem, and stationary. Remember, which is the weak form of this problem? The weak form is the following. The discrete weak form is A, A gradient of UH, comma VH plus viscosity gradient of UH, gradient of VH, minus pressure divergence of VH, plus QH divergence of UH. This is the Galerkin term. These are the Galerkin terms. Is that clear? That those are the Galerkin terms for this equation? So we have done that several times already, right? Plus, plus the sum for all the elements of tau k, a parameter, tau 1k, let me say, tau 1k, and then there is an operator, <coughs> let me call it a <coughs> perturbation operator, applied to the test functions, times the residual, which is a gradient of uh minus nu plus fraction of uh plus gradient of th, over element k, over element k, equal to the right hand side. I will not write the right hand side. Uh, or maybe I will. Which is equal to F H is the Golurkin term plus sum for all the elements of tau 1k perturbation of th qh times So let's consider this method. And if you wish, we can also add the term uh, P2, uh, so with tau 2, but this is not that important, OK? So in this framework, with this expression, we can write immediately uh, three cases, three cases. So what if you take P of VH QH equal to the convective term only? So I am only considering the uh, convection, if you, uh, the momentum equation. If you take only the convective term, what will happen? If you take only the convective, that would be exactly SUPG, streamline of wind. What we did for the convection diffusion equation, what we did for the convection diffusion equation, uh, extended to the Navier-Stokes case. What? So this, what does it do? It only stabilizes convection it 
only stabilizes convection. It introduces diffusion along the string lines, only. But that requires in superstable elements. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. That is SDPG. So what is, uh, um, if you take that equal to plus Laplacian of UVH plus A gradient of uh, pH, plus, excuse me, A gradient of VH plus gradient of pH, that would be the VMS, let's say, because of this sign, and that stabilizes both, stabilizes both convection, convection and interpolation. So you can use any interpolation. Why? Because the product of the convective term with the convective term will introduce streamline diffusion. Excuse me, this is Q, the test function. That will introduce streamline diffusion and the product of gradient of Q times gradient of P will stabilize pressure. That is VMS. And finally, the other possibility would be GLS, which is the operator which in this case is only a change in sign in the Laplace. So, uh, and in that case, the same happens. So if you look at this, what can you conclude? OK, if you want to use SUPG, you will have to use super stable elements. My advice is not to do that, <laughs> because I said several times that, OK, super, uh, in super stable elements are OK only for the Stokes problem, OK? Once you have uh, you you are, don't have the Stokes problem, super elements are not uh, are not uh, let's say reasonable. I would say. That's my I have several reasons for that. We can discuss but even the interpolation because the pressure has one order less of interpolation, which is good if the viscous term dominates. If you have this term that is important, then if you compare those two. You see that a good balance is to have one order more for the velocity than for the pressure. But what happens if this one dominates? You know, then it would, it would be com interesting to have the same interpolation for the velocity and the pressure. But what happens if you have porosity? Then it would be better to have one order less for the velocity than for the pressure. You know, I mean, in superstable elements, my, point, my opinion is that should be forgotten. But, I mean, Many, many people do use them. Most people use them. No, most perhaps not, but uh, many people use them. Okay? Well, this is uh, SUPG. VMS and, VMS and uh, GLS are very similar for that problem, very similar. There is only a change of sign in the viscous term. So it turns out that for, a lower, for linear elements, they are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. For higher order elements, for higher order elements, this one behaves better. But the error estimates that one is able to prove theoretically are the same. The stability estimates and the error estimates are the same. Okay? So GLS and VMS. But that one behaves better. By the way, which is the expression of that tau k? That tau k is C1 viscosity over h squared plus C2 a over h norm of a minus 1. Okay, that is the expression that this uh, tau k has to belong. What do we take in practice that works well? C1 of the order of 12, or 10, or whatever, and C2 of the order of 2. If you change it, nothing happens. If you change it, nothing happens. Okay? But for high order elements, it can be shown, it can be shown that the parameters that you have to take are these, but here you have to put the polynomial order to the power of 4. And here you have to put the polynomial order. This k is the polynomial order. Okay, k is the polynomial order. And very important, for all the three methods, as UPG, VMS, GLS, tau must be the same. Well, when I say must, I mean must behave in this way. In the literature, there are several expressions for, for tau, several. But they all behave the same. 
when I mean that they all behave the same, I mean that the, asympt the, the asymptotic behavior in terms of nu, in terms of a, and in terms of h, should always be this one. So you could, for example, as I said uh, in the other day, take the square of everything and then the square root. Or any function you wish that behaves like that. Any function you wish, it doesn't matter. But in the, in the asymptotic limits in terms of viscosity, velocity, and element size, it should behave this way. Okay? Good. So the comparison between these, I definitely favor this one. Not only because of the Navier-Stokes equations, so in the, for the Navier-Stokes equations alone, the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, okay, you know, these two behave similarly. The fact is that for any problem we have found that this works, and for some problems this doesn't work so well, GLS, okay? So this is the truth. We have been applying that to many problems, and in all problems that works. And not only that, the variation of multi-scale framework gives you a framework. So for example, we have designed this uh, nonlinear effect of the subscales, the dynamic subscales, and all that, assuming that variation of multiscale decomposition. You know, that gives you, uh, let's say, the idea of how to design a stabilization. So definitely, I would, fa I would favor VMS. That, that is my point. Then what about PSTG? So it, when analyzing this Stokes problem using GLS, it was clear, and that's why I have tried to stress that the reason why you stabilize pressure is the product of the gradient of the pressure times the gradient, uh, excuse me, the gradient of the pressure test function, function times the gradient of the pressure. So then you could say if SUPG stabilizes convection, and this is in fact the important term to stabilize pressure, let's do the following. Let's do what, it, what was called SUPG PSPG. Which it, I mean is designed in this way. I mean only with intuitive ideas, which is to add to the Galerkin terms the sum of Galerkin those terms plus the sum over the elements of tau one or tau one k a gradient of the h times the residual plus sum for all the elements of tau one k prime gradient of QH times the residual. That you have to put the residual, all the residual, well, the residual if you count also the right hand side, is necessary if you want to have a consistent method, okay? But since, let you say, you know, for convection diffusion, convection diffusion motivates this, SUPG. SUPG stands for a streamline upwind petrov -Gallertin. So an idea, let's see what happens, is to do what we did to stabilize the Stokes problem to extend it to Navier Stokes. Let's just put this. This was called PSPG, standing for pressure stabilization petrov -Gallertin. And so the method was called SUPG PSPG. Okay? That was uh, proposed uh, by by Tesluyer and, and, and Tesluyer. Okay. And you have a, a professor here that did uh, his PhD with him, and he's using this method. <laughs> however, however, first, this does not have any theory behind. Okay. This is just let's do the same. Let's stabilize convection through an SUPG term as let, let's stabilize pressure uh, using what happens for the Stokes case. Here you have a parameter, and if you really think, you really think that you have to add the two mechanisms separately, that could be different. If you stick to the idea that extending SUPG on one side and extending the pressure stabilization on the other, are independent issues, then those parameters are independent. However, does, this is not true. That only works if the parameter in one equation is equal to the parameter in the other equation. That is absolutely necessary for stability. And not only that, the parameters have to be equal to this one. The parameters have to be equal and equal to this one. 
for stability that can be shown rigorously. You can find co counter examples in which if this does not happen, um, the, so the method is not stable. Therefore, that method can, could, be, could, could be defined now that we have seen that shortcoming of the original concept, because in fact, and as I said, the original concept was to add independently the two dissipations, but that has to be equal to that. So at the bottom, at the end, you have the same method of this family, but with only a gradient of BH plus gradient of QH. Because if those two parameters are the same, I can add up these two terms, and I have as a perturbation a gradient of VH gradient of QH. That could be that would be P, uh, SUPG PSPG. That would be SUPG as uh, PSPG if you accept to take those two parameters equal. So what happens again? The, the properties of this method, of this method, and this method are very similar. You can prove almost the same. So is SUPG as, as, is VMS as good as GLS, as good as SUPG, PESPG? For that problem, you could think it is. In general, I definitely think it's not. Why? Because that has no extension to other problems. How do you do that? How do you extend that idea to Maxwell? How do you extend that idea to Darcy? How do you extend that idea to waves, to plates? To whatever you want, how do you extend that idea? This is a ridiculous idea, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry to be so that, that that that's the opinion session. <laughs> so <laughs> I've tried to be objective when talking about the general things. Um, I mean that was useful at its uh, time, but I think that has to be forgotten. I should, uh, I should, uh, I think it should. I was going to say it should be forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> but at least forgotten. <laughs> Constant. Yeah. So uh, okay. So that, that, let me finish maybe with that. So at the end, um, of course, the SUPG PSPG. It is obvious that it is an ad hoc method for the linear Stokes equation. It is not a, a, a stylization concept. So SUPG PSPG. It is obvious that you would not apply it to Maxwell. Where is SUPG? Where is streamline in Maxwell? Where is uh, pressure stabilization in Maxwell? You know, I mean, where is uh, if you de are dealing with uh, deflection and 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 bend in, in a in a in a, bend in a problem of bending of plates where the unknowns are the the deflections and the rotations? Where is pressure stabilization? Where is a streamline McQueen? So you, you understand. So th those are concepts that are completely obsolete from this from the point of view of, of stabilization. They are. Uh, clearly um, old, I mean, I would say. Uh, good. So that, those are the methods that we have. So we have, in fact, within the same structure, within the same structure, we have four methods. SUPG, VMS, GLS, and SUPG, PSPG. Okay? What about the constants? Well, these constants, the, the, this stabilization is the same as you encounter for 1D problems. As I said before, we, we justify that using Fourier's analysis. Okay? Using Fourier's analysis. So, in our case, Fourier's analysis allows us to compute the constant by considering particular cases. That's what we do, consider particular cases. For convection diffusion, for example, for that problem, minus k Laplacian of u, or let me write minus this nu Laplacian of u, that a gradient of u equals to r. You remember the, the what uh, sometimes was called the magic function that gives you exact nodal values in 1D, in 1D. So that magic function was half of the Peclet number equals to the hyperbolic cotangent of the Peclet number minus one of the Peclet number. If you plot it, if you plot it, it turns out the, that the asymptotic behavior here is one third and here is one. So that one, that asymptotic behavior, one third and one, corresponds one third and one, corresponds to take c one equals to twelve and c uh, two equals to two. That's why we take that. Okay, c one equals to twelve and c two equals to two. How do you check this? Well, remember, tau is equal to alpha h over um, alpha. This New. is this function Viscosity. over two h. Okay, so 
In the limit when alpha is small, in that limit when alpha is small, that has to behave as alpha, which is teclet over 3, teclet over 3, times h divided by 2a. So that means that this is teclet. The teclet is uh, 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 u over 2 times 3, because teclet is u h over 2 times 3, times h over, excuse me, 2k diffusion, 2k times uh, 3 times 3 times h over 2, ah, sorry, this is a, this is a velocity, okay, and then this cancels, this cancels, and this is precisely h squared over 2 times 3 times 2 is for 12k, 12k, okay, so the constant is 12 when uh, diffusion dominates. You see, that gives you C1. C1, in the diffusion dominated case. And on the other hand, when convection dominates, this should be 1. Alpha should be 1. So this should be H over 2A. And that immediately gives you C1 equals to 2. Excuse me, C2 equals to 2. C2 is 1. But be careful, this k is the polynomial order. This k, the, uh, uh, I am confusing all the time viscosity and diffusion. Okay? Okay. Is that clear? So these values, these constants, these magic constants, C1 and C and C2, are nothing but the optimal values in the one-dimensional case. Now, what happens in the, in the application? We have found those to be very good. We have found those constants to be very good, in general, experimentally. But if you don't know the constants and you say, OK, if you don't know the constants, why do you put there 12 and 2? OK, put something else. If you put something else and you put the error, you put the error against h, what we observe is what I said the other day. The convergence rate is the good one. But for a given h, you may have a better or, or a worse solution, but the convergence rate is the good one. So what we have observed experimentally, that's our experience, is that those constants, C1, 12, and C2, 2, are good to have almost the optimal value. But that's experience, nothing else. So if you want to change it, change it. You will have the same optimal method. The same optimal method. That, that this is like saying, what do you prefer? Uh, triangles with a straight angle or a triangles with all the angles, angles equal? Well, that depends. If you, are, if you manage to get a uh, structured mesh, this is better. If the mesh is arbitrary, this is better. Like it is, you know. Again, what does it mean better? Better means that the convergence rate is the same, but for a given h, you get a slightly smaller or greater error in one case or the other. So if you go to Maxwell's or uh, Gaves, uh, this constants. Yes, so for Maxwell and Waves, uh, in some cases, analytic cases, as 1D cases or, or model problems that we don't even polish, we get the constants and we just use that. And how do we get the constant? Using Fourier transforms. Fourier transforms are very useful, you know, because you change. Fourier transforms are very useful. You change the, the derivatives by algebraic operators. And you see in which case the norm of the Fourier transform is equal to the norm of the uh, operator applied to the unknown. So it's just a checking. You know, you check which norm makes the equality whole. And for that norm, we take the constant. Of course, you can only do that for model problems, for simple model problems in 1D and so on. So we, we, we start writing, we take a paper apart, and we see oh, the constant should be 3. And we put it in the computer and it works, more or less. I, I don't claim it's the best. I claim it's the best. Yeah, exactly. That gives, you, that gives you an order of magnitude. Okay? That gives you more or less the order of magnitude. And that, that has been always useful for us. It could be that in other problems it's not useful. I don't know. We have attempted problems, as I said, in, 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 in solid mechanics, for example. We have been working in plates, in plasticity, in damage. We, I mean, in... Um, and in all these cases, it works. It gives us uh, values, you know. And we have that published, so it is uh, available. 
So that's about the comment about uh, that, that, that I would think would be questions um, uh, A, B, and C. I don't know if you have a further question about A, B, and C. Ah, bubbles, yes, bubbles. Well, bubbles have a big problem. Bubbles will always give you, will always give you the same structure as BMS. Because bubbles, in fact, BMS, in a sense, is like a, a, like a, a method introducing bubble functions. It's the same. So what, what we do? What do you do? We do with BMS. We speak U into U H plus U prime, and we approximate U prime. Okay. What is done when you introduce bubbles? You approximate U H plus the bubble component. U bubble. So it's the same. In a sense, bubble functions can be understood as saying that this subcritical scale is a bubble function. But this is terribly restrictive. Why? Not because the assumption that it vanishes on the boundary, but because of the assumption that you have to assume a certain shape for the boundary. This is terribly restri restrictive because, for example, in 1D, in 1D, you say, I, I, you, you remember the plot that I gave. I said, okay, the solution will be some, the, the subgrade scales will be something like that, and we try to capture the mean, for example. Remember that? Yes. In the case of bubble, you say, okay, no, no, no. The solution will be like this. Okay. So this is very restrictive. Okay? I mean, of course, what is the problem? The problem is that you don't know the shape of the bubble. You don't know. For example, if you take that bubble in convection diffusion, think about this problem well. Remember what I'm saying. Please do. If you take this bubble, you will get that tau behaves as h squared over nu, which is wrong because it doesn't take into account convection. Excuse me, tau minus one. But in convection diffusion, you could obtain the exact bubble, the residual free bubble. You could obtain the residual free bubble and looks like that. It takes into account convection. I mean, there is not only one, by the way. Remember, how many residual free bubbles do you have to compute with two nodes? You have to compute as many as number of nodes plus one for the forcing term. So you have three residual free bubbles. So think about what would you do to obtain the three residual free bubbles. They are very strange. They are not just a parabola. Okay, they are not just a parabola. So, what is the message? The message is, using bubbles is fine, but you're restricted by the a priori assumptions on how the bubble is. Look at this. If you assume that you have a parabolic bubble, you do nothing. You're lost. You're, you're absolutely um, out of the target. So bubbles are an idea that is reasonable, but not useful. Not useful because the shape of the bubble is unknown. Here, at least, we know the final structure that tau has to have because of that uh, Fourier analysis or the function or whatever. With bubbles, bubbles only serve um, only serve at, at, at its moment for um, for the Stokes problem. And in the case of all the problems, you have to these, to resort to residual free bubbles, which were too difficult to compute. Okay, so that concerns the three questions one, A, B, and B. What about question C and E? So I can take ten, ten more minutes. What about questions uh, uh, C and E? Well, question C, and instead of question C, I, I could uh, explain. I mean. In fact, SUPG in fractional step methods is very simple. I don't know who posed that question. SUPG for fractional step methods. Who posed that question? No worry. Anyway, this is, this is, SUPG for fractional step methods is not difficult because in SUPG you have time derivative of UH, DH, plus, and, well, the colorative terms. Uh, the, the rest of the terms 
plus, and then you have uh, the sum for all the elements of tau k times derivative, oh, excuse me, a dot gradient of pH times the version. So essentially what you do when you do fractional step schemes is you replace this by u tilde n plus 1 minus u tilde n divided by delta t plus all the terms minus the pressure gradient, you, you uh, interpolation, you extrapolate extrapolation of gradient of the pressure, for example, either by zero, that would be a first order method, or by the gradient of the pressure at the previous time step, which would be give a first order method. And then for the end of the step velocity, you put, um, you use this, or, or, or to second order, it doesn't matter. Plus, here you put the pressure correction, correction equals to zero, and then the inversions of u and plus one equals to zero, in which form you wish, okay? All this multiplied by the test function if you wish. Thank you. Okay, so SUPG in fact is, uh, is, uh, doesn't change anything. Hmm? SUPG doesn't change anything. What changes something, what changes something is, for example, all methods that introduce the gradient of the pressure test function. Because then in the splitting, it's not clear how to do that. Why is not? Then the, 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 the best thing you can do is to uh, deal with the problem at the algebraic level. That's what I would recommend. That's what we did in the last part of the section about uh, fractional step methods. In the section about fractional step methods, we saw that we can write the problem as follows. M uh, time derivative of u using p plus a matrix times u plus a matrix times the pressure nodal values equal to f and divergence of the velocity equal to zero. This is Galerti, right? This is Galerti. If you use any of the methods that we have seen, so EMS, SUPG, ESPG, GLS, even bubbles, whatever. If you use any of these methods, you will have a modification of all the matrices. So let me put an over bar to denote that you will have a modification of all the matrices. And you will have also a modification in the last equation that we introduced a term of the form, a stabilization matrix times P in the continuity equation. Where does this come from? This precisely com comes from gradient of Q multiplied by gradient of Q the residual. You know? This term, gradient of Q, gradient of P, will, will contribute to the continuity equation, because it is tested, it is tested against Q, and will be multiplying the degrees of freedom of pressure, so it will be like that, okay? If you want, if you write that as a vector, as a, in vector form, the equation is this one, m zero 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 time derivative of velocity pressure plus k gradient divergence up equal to the right hand side f zero. So what we do with the stabilization is uh, we change the matrices and we add a contribution to the two true term. Okay. But this is not important. This is not important because um, the structure of the, of the differential equation is the same. Essentially, what it is is a die, a differential algebraic equation. And it is still a die if, uh, if you put here a certain matrix, because that will be, anyway, uh, an algebraic restriction. So it's an, a differential equation with an algebraic equation. Okay. So you can do the same steps as we did before. For example, using backward Euler, we could use other things, but for example, using backward Euler, you discretize this system by u tilde n plus 1 minus u n divided by delta t plus k bar u tilde u at n plus 1 plus an extrapolation of the pressure equal to f. Let me comment on that. I will call it extrapolation of the pressure with this with this tilde, okay? At n plus one equal to f at n plus one. And then m u n plus one 
minus un divided by delta t, u per, excuse me, un plus one tilde. No, no, let's forget about this tilde. I will have to use another symbol. Let, let me put extrapolated, extrapolated, plus uh, gradient of p n plus 1 minus the extrapolated pressure at n plus 1 equal to 0. And then, instead of having only divergence of u n plus 1 equal to 0, we have divergence of u plus s p n plus 1. Okay, so this, as you see, this is exact. Okay, this system is exactly the same as this one. I haven't done any approximation. I haven't done any approximation. Okay, well, I have used the backward toiler scheme, but apart from that, I haven't used any approximation. So, what happens when you want to do, to design a fractional step method? When you want to design a fractional step method, what you do is you evaluate the convective, the that matrix instead of evaluating that with matrix with u, you evaluate it with u tilde with the same one as this. That allows you to compute u tilde from this equation, and then once you have this equation, you insert it in the second one and you compute velocity and pressure, and then you could also use the Poisson equation for the pressure and compute first the pressure and then the velocity. But what I mean is that you do exactly the same steps, exactly the same steps, okay? So this is the only approximation you do when you design a fractional step method. If you look at the problem from the pure algebraic point of view, okay, pure algebraic point. So which is the extrapolated pressure? The extrapolated pressure is zero for a first order scheme or Pn for a second order scheme. Second order, order scheme. So what is the, uh, it, it should be, for example, uh, it should be 2 Pn minus Pn minus 1 for a third order scheme, but that doesn't work. That doesn't work, so throw it away. Anyway, well, uh, that's it. So the, the, what the message is that a stabilized finite element methods, any of these, any of these, SUPG, GLS, DMS, um, SUPG, PSPG, can be used easily in the context of fractional step methods. So, not yet. Okay, and final question. What about taylor galerkin I haven't mentioned taylor galerkin It's a method that is also very obsolete. <laughs> Sorry for being so, let's say, uh, for being such a, a strong assess assessment. So that's Taylor Galerkin, and with that we finish, unless you have other questions. What about Taylor Galerkin? I, I never thought I would finish a course talking about Taylor Galerkin, you know. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> Taylor Galerkin. Uh, that's a curiosity that happened, that uh, appeared in the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. I know very well the man that, the, that I knew very well the person that developed Taylor Galerkin, and I have discussed with him that is uh, Jan Donea. He died some time ago, young, by the way, uh, or relatively young. Um, and the, the, what I'm going to say you now, I have told that to him, and he agrees. So it's it's not that that. Uh, so Taylor Galerkin is a little bit a game, you know. It's extending the ideas of Lux Wendroff. Lux Wendroff was a method that is also obsolete in the context of finite differences to finite elements. That's the only idea. What is the idea? Imagine you have a, an operator of the form du dt plus L of u equal to f. And L will be, for example, convection diffusion. L u is equal to minus nu Laplacian of u plus a gradient of u. For example, convection diffusion. Hmm? And suppose you discretize it in time. You discretize it in time, and you say, if you have, a, for example, forward Euler, forward Euler would be this. That would be forward Euler, okay, explicit Euler. Let's say uh, that would be explicit Euler, okay, using the notation that we have introduced. That is unstable. That, for example, for convection diffusion leads to instabilities. But then you say, oh, that's because that's because I have approximated the time derivative only to first order. That's because I have said u at n plus 1 
is equal to un plus um, delta t times the derivative with respect to time at n plus terms of order delta t squared. So that's the approximation that I have used, right? So instead of doing that, let's do a, a second order approximation in time. So we still use that. It's sort of a mixture of concepts, time discretization, space discretization. So it's, it's like a mess of concepts, but it's like it works, OK? So now we put delta t squared over 2 times second derivative with respect to time plus terms of order delta t cube, Taylor expansion of order up to delta t to the power of 3. And of course, we don't have second derivatives in our equation, which is only first order in time. But we, make, uh, we can make second derivatives arise. How? We take the first derivative of this. I mean, don't ask me about regularity. Don't, don't ask me about rigor. Okay? I just take the second derivative of this. So second derivative of u with respect to t twice plus, and I will also assume that time differentiation and the operators in the operator l commute. So I will have l time derivative of u with respect to time equals to the time derivative of f with respect to time. Hmm? So, oh, but uh, the time derivative of u is f minus l of u. So it happens the second derivative of u with respect to time twice is equal to the time derivative of f minus, I move it to the right hand side, l times the first derivative of u. But the first derivative of u is f minus the, the derivative of u with respect to time. Uh, that's, uh, that's easy, right? What does it, whether it makes sense to apply the derivative, the operator L to F, who knows? I mean, if, if F is a point load, do you apply in second derivatives to a point load? Anyway, let's forget it. Um, well, then what we can do is the following. Then I write this as UN plus delta T, first derivative. The first derivative is F minus L of U, FN minus L of UN. That is what we have done. That we have done. What we have done here is this. Okay. What we have done here is this, right? But now we add the second derivative of u. Excuse me. Delta t over two times the second derivative of u. Then we add delta f over delta t minus l of f minus minus du dt, and then. Uh, plus order, te terms of orders, delta u squared. Okay? And what is du dt? So let me rewrite things. This is un plus delta t fn minus lun plus delta t squared over 2 times time derivative of f minus l of f l of f, whatever it is, and then we have plus l of the time derivative of u. Well, the time derivative of u is f minus l of u. That is what, uh, uh, oh, uh, yes, that's correct. The time derivative of u is f minus l of u. So this is l times f minus l of u plus terms of order delta, delta t. Squared. The t cube, sorry. The t cube. Well, anyway, so what do we have? We have a complicated right hand side. That goes to the right hand side. That goes to the right hand side, and that goes to the right hand side. All these terms depend on f, and they go to the right hand side. But what happens concerning the operator L? So we have that un plus 1 is equal to un, un plus or minus delta t l of un minus delta t l of, delta t l of un and then plus l of l of un plus delta t squared over over 2 delta t squared over 2 l of l of u at n 
plus turns to go to the right hand side. Additional turns that go to the right hand side. Okay? Did you follow that? Only by keeping that term and then computing second derivatives by taking the, second, the, 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 the derivative of the equation with respect to time. Now let's do the let's obtain the weak form. Let's obtain the weak form. The weak form will be the integral of test function u n plus one equals integral of the test function u n minus delta t times what will give l of u tested against l of u tested against p. It will be the bilinear form of the problem, whatever it is, whatever it is, b times u n. That would be the Galerkin method. Do you agree with me? That would be the Galerkin method, right? Plus, let me write it this way: delta t times delta t over two, and then the testing of b against l of l of u at n plus a right hand side term. So this is the stabilizing effect. This is a stabilizing term. This is a stabilizing term of the Taylor Galerkin method. Now when you divide the you the thing what strange is it? It's not strange. It's not strange. It's not strange. When you divide by delta t everything, because you, I mean, if you write it in the classical way, u n minus u n plus one minus u n divided by delta t, you see that the additional term is this delta t over two. That's why I have written this way times this. But look, if you integrate by parts, essentially, essentially, this is delta t over two, and up to up to um, let's say boundary terms, this is the adjoint applied to the test function times L of u, of uh, because now we are discretizing up to 100 terms. And here we have a plus, so I could put a minus to keep it consistent with the bilinear form, a minus, and here I could put a minus. <laughs> you see? So I have been playing like magic, <laughs> and at the end, what have I got? So the idea of Taylor Galerkin is this one to keep a further term in in the in the time in the time expansion. Play with the equation, you know, play, brr, manipulate the equation, and see that this term is this one. The additional term that I am adding is this one. The additional term that I am adding is this one. But this one can be written this way. So what do I see? I see that I have recovered a sort of VMS method, but the amount of stabilization is not tau, is delta t over 2. So the amount of stability is given, remember, the problem, the stability problem is a stability problem in space. <laughs> we have instabilities in space, but the amount of stability we put is the time step size over 2. So sort of, you know, uh, combining concepts uh, in a strange way. Well, that's it. Uh, and there it, th that has many conceptual problems. For example, that idea applies if I it use if I start from the explicit uh, forward Euler, or the, from the explicit. So the Taylor series goes this way, u n, and then I, I evaluate that at u n at u n. <laughs> the, the, the idea should apply also to the implicit case. So I should go. I should be able to go backward instead of forward. So instead of going from u n to u n plus one, if that idea is correct, I should be able to go also backward. So u n equal to u n plus one minus delta t du t d n at n plus one plus because you know that there is a change of sign if you go backwards in the Taylor expansion plus delta t squared over 2, second derivative with respect to time of the, but it doesn't work. Because if you move backwards, if you try to use the same argument for the implicit Euler scheme, the diffusion you add happens to be negative, which is, you know, uh, uh, you are adding instability. So it's a sort of trick 
that in one case more or less worked. In the 80s, it was used even for compressible flow and so on, but definitely to be abandoned, if not abandoned already. Okay. What else? That is table over there. Oh, that's a very important topic. But that's a topic in, in general in, in CFD, computational fluid mechanics, not in this uh, in this course. That is a topic that I particularly like. Um, you have two options. One option is to use this space-time formulation that I mentioned bri briefly when talking about uh, time integration. In that case, it is natural. And the other, stop, the other uh, when you have moving domains, you can use the so-called arbitrary Lagrangian Lagrangian Eulerian methods. Lagrangian Eulerian. So, of course, I cannot talk about them. I mean, I cannot explain them because I should explain what the Lagrangian method is, what an Eulerian method is, what an intermediate method is, uh, the, the concept of convective coordinates, and so on. But the idea is that the idea is simple. Imagine that you have a domain that in time moves and, and becomes this one. Okay? So the idea is that you can define you can define the motion of the nodes. For example, typically the boundary nodes have a motion that is given. Typically, the boundary nodes have a motion that is given. And then you define the way you like, the way you prefer, the motion of the interior nodes. You define the motion of the interior nodes the way you prefer. Okay? And then, um, the way you prefer can, can be such that the mesh is not distorted. Okay, the mesh is not distorted. So you move the nodes. You so just we, move the nodes. We can move the mesh. Yeah, yeah. when I say do you move the nodes, you move the mesh. Of course, the mesh is essentially the nodes and the connections. Yes. Okay? So you move the mesh. You deform the mesh according to what you want. And that defines, if you have a certain displacement, uh, so you, you have the position of a node is UN at time step n, and then is un plus 1 at time step n plus 1, that defines a velocity of the nodes, that I will call velocity of the domain, that is un plus 1 minus un divided by delta t. That's the velocity of the nodes, okay? Of the, of the nodes of the mesh. Huh? So the mesh is moving. I will not explain why. That, that is related to, as I said, the concept of convective coordinates and so on. So it turns out that the only thing you have to do, the only thing you have to do, is to modify the advective velocity, the advective term, in an, anywhere. So the, let's put the velocity of the convective term of any quantity, phi, has to be replaced by the advection minus the advection of the domain particles. Very little phi. So it's very simple to implement. Okay? It's extremely simple to implement. You define the velocity of the nodes, and then, arbitrarily, you compute that velocity, velocity of the domain, I said here. And then, everything is exactly the same, replacing the advection velocity by the velocity of the domain. Uh, that is the so-called AIL method, that is the Lagrangian Eulerian method. Okay? That is the, the final result, the, although what I don't have time to explain, but that would require uh, an hour or so, a couple of hours, it is the basis of that. Okay. You should talk about uh, Lagrangian coordinates, so Eulerian uh, coordinates. You, can you give me some reference for this? Uh, oh, yes. This? Uh, that is, for example, well, it's, the problem is that there is a, a review paper in the Encyclopedia of Computational Mechanics by a friend of mine who is Antonio Huerta. But in fact, <laughs> in fact, that review paper, the first author is Jan Donea. That review paper, the first author is Jan Donia, who is the one that developed the Taylor Galerkin method. Okay? Jan Donia developed Taylor Galerkin, and he is the first author of that paper. It's a review paper, and it's also by uh, Philippe Ponto, Philippe Ponto, Antonio Huerta, 
And I think... Uh, it's a little big. An Antonio Rodriguez. Rodriguez. It's a little big. Anyway, pardon me? It's a little big. Oh, yeah, a little bit bigger. Yeah, sorry for the letter. So look for Jan Donet. It's Encyclopedia of Computational Mechanics. And Jan Donet. Jan Donet. Antonio Huerta. Uh, Pontot, well, it, anyway, it's also Pontot and Antonio Rodriguez. Well, anyway, I mean, you will find that. It's a review paper, so it's a, a review of eight methods. It's called Arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian Methods in Computational Mechanics or something like that. It's a paper of 100 pages, so it's not, it's not something that can be just said. That's it. And we have worked a lot in the age as well. I mean, it's a topic that I particularly like. What else? How is the time step to be chosen? I mean, what is the effect of time step on, on the stability in VMS? In VMS, in principle, if you do it correctly, it shouldn't be, it should, there, there shouldn't be any effect. But there is. There is because, um, there is, well, I mean, there is always an interaction between space and time discretization, it's obvious. I mean, we have seen the error estimates that couple space and time. But, um, well, this is uh, maybe too deep. Um, if you want to stay, uh, to obtain those estimates in a stabilized finite element method, you need usually relationships between delta t and h. So the space discretization and the time discretization. You need them. You do the analysis. It turns out that in usual, in usual uh, stabilized Tolerkin methods, you cannot choose delta t, delta t independently of h. Okay? This is a question that a priori you cannot see. I mean, you look at the equations. I mean, maybe maybe you are very very clever and you see it at first glance, but in general you don't see it. In general you don't see it. But there is. When you start, you sit down and you do the analysis. There is a relationship between delta t and h squared. However. We managed to avoid that, that restriction by using dynamics of scales. And we have several papers published about that, in particular one which is an analysis paper for the Stokes problem that shows that if you use, sorry for making publicity of my work, but if, uh, if you use dynamics of scales, so if you take into account the time derivative of u prime, and of course you approximate the differential operator by tau, so if you approximate the, the subscale this way, taking into account the derivative of u prime, you are completely free. You can choose any approximation in the space and time. I don't know if we gave the good name to the paper because since the idea was that you are free, we thought that, okay, that allows you to use delta t as small as you wish. And we call that an isotropic space-time approximation in the sense that it's not isotropic. The element in the time direction can be as small as you wish. But I think the name is not very applicable because many people have asked me, what does it mean, an isotropic space-time discretization, you know? So it was not a good name. But if you look in the web, um, it's a paper that I published with a colleague of mine called Santibadia about five years ago. So maybe five years ago, yeah, sort of like that. But yes, it, that is an important question. The relationship between the time step size and the, and the space size in a stabilized finite element method. It's, a, it's an important question, but cannot be explained just like that, you know? I mean, just that message. You have a condition in classical methods, you don't have that condition using dynamics of scales. Okay. Uh, 